morning, everybody. Welcome to my front porch. And yeah, I am a day late this week because I had a touch of the flu. And it's still kind of hanging on. It's, it's going away. I'm getting better, though. <laughs> it put me back by one day on my schedule this week. Today, we are in Enoch, chapter 73, 74, and 75. Okay, And in this chapter, he speaks about the moon and the phases of the moon and things like that. And then in chapter 75, he gets into the stars. Okay, <laughs> this is very interesting and it's really complex and I don't understand all of it, but let's get started. All right. Now, this is Enoch chapter 73, verse 1, and he starts out saying, And after this law, I saw another law dealing with the smaller luminary, which is named the moon. Now, when he says, and after this law, he's speaking about uh, the subject that he was talking about in chapter 72, which was all about the sun. That whole chapter was about the the rising and setting of the sun and all that. Now, this is dealing with the smaller luminary, which is named the moon, he says here. Now, what's interesting about this here is he calls it the smaller luminary. All right? Now, he had just said at the very end of the last chapter that they were equal in size. Yes. As far as when you look at them, they're equal in size. Uh, by smaller luminary, I'm thinking that he probably means lesser, you know, because it's a lesser light. It's a smaller light than that of the sun, of course. Verse 2, and her circumference is like the circumference of the heaven. And her chariot in which she rides is driven by the wind, and light is given to her in definite measure. Okay. Now, that phrase that the circumference is like the circumference of the heaven. Now, in the last chapter, it said that about the sun also. And I really didn't comment on it. I just read through. But here it's saying it about the moon also. The circumference is like the circumference of the heaven. Okay, now the circumference is the distance around a circle. It has to do with a circuit, okay? So this circumference, in saying that the circumference is like the circumference of the heaven, um, it sounds to me like it's just stating that the heaven, the whole heaven itself, or the firmament, if you will, is circular like the circumference of the sun and the moon. That's just my guess. Verse 3, And her rising and setting change every month. The moon. Yeah, it changes all the time. And her days are like the days of the sun. And when her light is uniform or full, it amounts to the seventh part of the light of the sun. All right. So here it's saying that the full moon is one seventh of the light of the sun. That sounds about right. You know, when the full moon is out, you know, it can be really pretty light out, you know. Um, now, this brought up a whole other thing in my mind when I read this. The light of the moon. The interesting thing about this light of the moon is that it is a cold light. The light of the sun is a hot light. Uh, and you can perform an experiment yourself and prove this, that the light of the moon is cold. The light and the light of the sun is hot, of course. We know that. You know, if you have a thermometer and you stand in the shade on a hot sunny day, 
the temperature is going to be lower in the shade than what it is in the full blazing sun. It's going to be hotter, okay? Now, at the time of the full moon, if you stand in a shady area out of the light of the moon, the temperature will actually be warmer than what it is in the full light of the moon. Yeah, the light of the moon is a cold light. The temperature is actually lower in the full light of the moon than what it is in a shaded area away from that light. This is true. And you can check it out yourself. It's true. I have. Verse 4. And thus she rises, and her first phase in the east comes forth on the thirtieth morning. And on that day she becomes visible, and constitutes for you the first phase of the moon on the thirtieth day, together with the sun in the portal where the sun rises. Okay? So it's back to the portals again. Now, also, the phases of the moon that it's speaking of here cannot be the shadow of the earth on the moon. And this can be proven <laughs> just merely by observing it and looking at it. Okay? Now, sometimes the sun will go down in the west. And I've observed this. The sun will go down in the west. Okay? And later on that night, after the sun has well gone down, say at 11, 12 o'clock at night, you'll see the moon come rising on the eastern horizon. A full moon at some times of the year. Now how could that be the reflection of the sun when the earth is in between them? Okay? Here's another thing to consider. How many times in the day do you see the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time? But yet the moon is maybe a crescent moon or a half moon. But you see it in the sky at the same time as the sun. So how could that be Earth's shadow on the moon? It couldn't possibly be. <laughs> the Earth would have to be in between the sun and the moon in order for it to cast a shadow there. So they've told us for years that the phases of the moon are the shadow of the Earth on the moon. But that's, just by common sense, when you look at that, that's not possible. It's just not. And all you have to do is just look at it. Now, in talking about this, this leads us into the whole idea of cognitive dissonance. And what that is, is when you're taught a certain thing all your life, and you're brought up to believe things are a certain way, then you get some information that contradicts your teaching. Then you don't want to believe it. You want to throw it away. You say, oh, that's ridiculous. That's nonsense. I, you know, and you, and you shut it down right away. That's cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and we've all been victim of this. Now, what I've tried to do, uh, oh, probably for the last 10 years or so, I've really been into this, and I've really opened my eyes to a lot of things in the earth, a lot of things that go on in, in nature and things like that. You know, if you just observe these things and watch what happens, you'll see that what we've been told can't possibly be true, because it doesn't line up with the plain evidence of what we see. Okay, And this is true with the phases of the moon. It's something else, and it's mysterious. We don't know what it is, and scientists don't know what it is. But they don't want to admit that. They don't want you to know that they don't know what it is and they don't understand it. Because a lot of these things are in God's hand. A lot of these things are still mysteries. And they don't want to admit that they're mysteries. That's what I think. I don't know. 
And I'm not a conspiracy theorist either. You know, because this is not conspiracy. This is fact. This is fact. The light of the moon is cold. All right? And how could it be reflecting the light of the sun when the sun is on the other side of the earth? In the west, and then you see the full moon in the east. How could that be the light of the sun? It's not. It's not. And then when you see the, the crescent moon up there, and it can't possibly be the shadow of the earth on the moon, just by logic. All right. <laughs> I'm going to move on here. Verse 5. And the one half of her goes forth by a seventh part. This is the moon he's talking about here. And her whole circumference is empty without light, with the exception of one-seventh part of it, and the fourteenth part of her light. And when she receives one-seventh part of the half of her light, her light amounts to one-seventh part and the half thereof. And she sets with the sun, and when the sun rises, the moon rises with him. See? Him. The moon is referred to as she. Isn't that interesting? And she sets with the sun, and when the sun rises, the moon rises with him, and receives the half of one part of light, and in that night, in the beginning of her morning, in the commencement of the lunar day, the moon sets with the sun, and is invisible that night, when you can't see the moon, with the 14 parts and the half of one of them. <laughs> and she rises on that day with exactly a seventh part and comes forth and recedes from the rising of the sun. And in her remaining days, she becomes bright in the remaining 13 parts. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is confusing, and I don't understand it. But this is what was shown to Enoch. And this is what he wrote. Chapter 74. And I saw another course, a law for her, for the moon, and how according to that law, she performs her monthly revolution. And all these, Uriel, the holy angel, who is the leader of them all, He's the leader of all these heavenly luminaries, okay? Showed to me and their positions, and I wrote down their positions as he showed them to me. And I wrote down their months as they were, and the appearance of their lights, till 15 days were accomplished. In single seventh parts, she accomplishes all her light in the east, and in single seventh parts accomplishes all her darkness in the west. And in certain months she alters her settings, and in certain months she pursues her own peculiar course. Yes, she does, doesn't she? In two months the moon sets with the sun. In those two middle portals, the third and the fourth. She goes forth for seven days and turns about and returns again through the portal where the sun rises and accomplishes all her light. And she recedes from the sun and in eight days enters the sixth portal from which the sun goes forth. And when the sun goes forth from the fourth portal, she goes forth seven days until she goes forth from the fifth and turns back again in seven days into the fourth portal and accomplishes all her light and she recedes and enters into the first portal in eight days. All right, now remember that in the last chapter uh, he explained the portals, that there were six in the east and six in the west. And those are areas where you see the sun or moon rising or setting, whatever the case may be. Okay? 
and she returns again in seven days into the fourth portal from which the sun goes forth. Thus, I saw their position, how the moons rose, the different phases of the moon, it's just one moon, He's not. he doesn't mean multiple moons when he says moons. Thus I saw their position, how the moons rose and the sun set in those days. And if five years are added together, the sun has an overplus of 30 days. And all the days which accrue to it, for one of those five years, when they are full, amount to 364 days, which is the days in the year, according to this Enochian calendar. Okay? But then there's extra days added in at different times, which would account for our 365 days. And the overplus of the sun and of the stars amounts to six days. In five years, six days, every year come to 30 days. And the moon falls behind the sun and stars to the number of 30 days. And the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly so that they do not advance or delay their position by a single day unto eternity, but complete the years with perfect justice in 364 days. Okay, now, accuracy, there's a lot of criticism about this. If you do a search on this, about the Enoch calendar online, You'll find a lot of different opinions about this. Uh, some people say, well, this is just crazy. It's it's not right. The Enoch, Enoch calendar is, uh, is off. But then there's other people that say just the opposite. They say that it's incredibly accurate considering the time that this was written in. You know, and we can only assume that this was pre-flood. Now, of course... It may have been a little bit different also before the Great Deluge. We have to remember that too. Uh, the whole nature of the earth was was different before the flood than what it was after. So, you know, that may account for any discrepancies that might be there also. Verse 13. In three years, there are 1,092 days. And in five years, 1,820 days. So that in eight years, there are 2,912 days. Now this is figured on a 364-day year. For the moon alone, the days amount in three years to 1,062 days. And in five years, she falls 50 days behind I guess behind of what the sun is and in five years she falls 50 days behind to the sum of 1,770 there is to be added 1,062 days and in five years there are 1,770 days so that for the moon the days in eight years amount to 2,000 832 days. For in eight years she falls behind to the amount of 80 days. And all the days she falls behind in eight years are 80. And the year is accurately completed in conformity with their world stations and the stations of the sun, which rise from the portals through which it, the sun, rises and sets 30 days. <laughs> Did you get all that? <laughs> I know. I didn't either. This is very confusing. All right. Chapter 75. Now here, he moves away from this discussion about the moon. And he moves into talking about the stars. Verse 1. 
and the leaders of the heads of the thousands who are placed over the whole creation and over all the stars have also to do with the four intercalary days being inseparable from their office according to the reckoning of the year and these render service on the four days which are not reckoned in the reckoning of the year. Right at the beginning of that verse when he says the leaders of the heads of the thousands. These leaders are called luminaries in the next verse. That the leaders of the heads of the thousands. Okay? He says, and owing to them, men go wrong therein. For those luminaries truly render service on the world stations. One in the first portal, one in the third portal of the heaven, one in the fourth portal, and one in the sixth portal. And the exactness of the year is accomplished through its separate 364 stations. Okay? Verse 3, for the signs and the times and the years and the days the angel Uriel showed to me, whom the Lord of glory hath set forever over all the luminaries of the heaven, in the heaven and in the world, that they should rule on the face of the heaven and be seen on the earth and be leaders of for the day and the night, the sun, moon, and stars, and all the ministering creatures which make their revolution in all the chariots of the heaven. Now that's interesting there where he says the ministering creatures, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the ministering creatures. So these are living things. They're living, these luminaries. They aren't just inanimate lights, okay? and they aren't called angels either. There's places in scripture where it's called the host of heaven. But here in Enoch, he speaks of them as luminaries. Maybe they're a type of the angelic host. And that's a very big possibility there. Ministering creatures. Then notice also that he said there that they make their revolution in all the chariots of the heaven. Their revolution. Okay? Now, modern science tells us that the earth revolves a thousand miles an hour. That it revolves again around the sun in like 60,000 miles an hour, something like that. And then the entire solar system rockets through the universe at hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. And then the galaxy itself, they say, they don't know, they're just saying this, rockets through the universe at breakneck speeds. Now, if we were making all those crazy twists and turns, the stars would be different every night. There'd be no way to tell what anything was. It would all just be all mixed up and scattered. And it's not. It's not. It's very set, like an intricate timepiece. Okay? This is all just common sense. So, when you read this, you know, people can criticize this and say, no, oh, that's ridiculous. That's archaic, these things that Enoch is saying here. Because we know better than this, because science has, has told us this other thing. Okay? But if you look at what they're telling us, it's just as ridiculous, if not more ridiculous, than what Enoch says. You know? When you really think about it. The fact is, I don't think that we know. We don't know. The Lord is in control of all these things. And he's, he's put 
angels and, and things that are in charge of these things, you know, and he directs the whole thing. We don't. But yeah, the revolution. The ministering creatures which make, make their revolution in all the chariots of the heaven. They revolve. They go in huge circles. Okay? Now right in the beginning of verse 3 there, he said, The signs and the times and the years and the days the Uriel the angel showed him. All right? Now once again, I quoted this in the last video, but this takes us back to creation, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, where it says there, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. So what Enoch says there very much echoes that. Now, they're for signs. And the Lord Jesus spoke of this. In Luke 21, verses 25 through 28, he's speaking of things that will occur at the end of the age, at the day of the Lord, at the time of his return. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, seeing the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So, right in the beginning, he tells us, in the beginning, in creation, he tells us that these things are put there for signs. But then, on the day of the Lord, they will be for signs also. They'll be for different type of signs. We don't know for sure exactly what will occur, but it'll be something that we can't miss. Uh, I believe that they will maybe start going in a different direction or changing in some way that, that people will be really distressed and upset about it. You know? Maybe the sun will start moving backwards. I don't know. But that's one of the things that we need to look for, is changes in the heavenly bodies. And I think it'll be something that we can't really miss. Verse 4. In like manner, twelve doors Uriel showed me, open in the circumference of the sun's chariot in the heaven. Twelve doors in the sun. Through which the rays of the sun break forth, and from them is warmth diffused over the earth, when they are opened at their appointed seasons. And for the winds and the spirit of the dew, when they are opened, standing open in the heavens at the ends. That's really confusing right there. Some scholars believe that verse 5 there is either out of place, and R.H. Charles did say that something is missing, that there was something that was indecipherable from the beginning of verse 5, and that gives us trouble in understanding what he's saying there. Verse 6, as for the twelve portals in the heaven at the ends of the earth, out of which go forth the sun, moon, and stars and all the works of heaven in the east and in the west. There are many windows open to the left and right of them, and one window at its appointed season produces warmth, corresponding as these do to those doors from which the stars come forth, according as he has commanded them, and wherein they set 
corresponding to their number. And I saw chariots in the heaven running in the world above those portals in which revolve the stars that never set. And one is larger than all the rest. And it is that that makes its course through the entire world. Now, R.H. Charles said there that he believes that he's talking about a constellation there, a sign, when he says that one is larger than all the rest. And he suggests that maybe he's speaking of the Big Dipper, which is Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. Um, I don't know. He could just be talking about the sun being larger than the rest. I'm not sure. But he's speaking of the stars here. Okay? The stars revolve that never set, he said there in verse 8. They revolve and they never set. They're there all during the day. We don't see them because the light of the sun, the daylight, uh, blocks it out where we can't see the light from the stars. But they're there. <laughs> they're there all the time. They never leave. They never set, is what he's saying here. Now, that brings me to the whole subject of star trails. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen any time-lapse videos of the stars in the sky. So I'm going to show you one here. Now, this is a video, a time-lapse, of the stars in the northern hemisphere. And you can see one star in the middle there that doesn't move. That's Polaris. And the others revolve all around it. And they go in circles around it like that. Polaris never moves. There are ancient monuments on the Earth that point exactly to where Polaris is. And it never changes. It never changes. Polaris, the North Star, is right in that one spot. And all the stars revolve around it. All right? Now, consider what these scientists have told everybody, what we're taught in school. Just consider that. Think about it. It is impossible for what they say to be true, and yet all those stars go in a perfect circle like that. Polaris, the North Star, remains centered. Maybe for some of you, I've opened up a can of worms here. I don't know. But we need to think for ourselves. Not just believe everything somebody says because they have a degree and they're a scientist. Because somebody's wearing a white lab coat doesn't mean that everything that they say is accurate. Right? In Psalm. 148 verses 1 through 6 the psalmist there praises the Lord in regards to these heavenly bodies that we're talking about here and he said praise ye the Lord praise ye the Lord from the heavens praise him in the heights praise ye him all his angels Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Hmm. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. No, his decree will stand until, until he says otherwise. You know, we know that there will be a change at some point. In a new heaven and new earth, there will be a change in some way. 
But what he has decreed for the sun and the moon, as long as this this age continues, the sun, the moon, and the stars are going to move and going to do exactly what he has ordained them to do. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together with my friends. Lord, I ask that eyes would be opened, hearts would be opened, and we pray that your word would be opened to us. Lord, we just thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your love. And Lord, we return that love and we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Well, that was interesting, huh? It was difficult, too, and not really understandable. But hey, we don't have to understand everything right now. In time, we'll know more, right? And I'll see you all the next time around. I love you. Bye-bye.